Okay, thank you, Sean. And it's uh, good to meet with some people on uh, Zoom. Uh, most of you I haven't seen all year, thinking of people like Sean and and also Safiso and Cengaze. Um, Okay, let me just get my presentation and share my screen. And make it... And let me make it full screen. It's not showing the full screen yet. Okay, there we go. Thank okay, you. yep, yep. That was somehow there's some some you know how it goes, some silly Windows message came up which I had to kill first. Okay, um, right, so I'm going to talking a little bit, especially about low concentration radon measurements and why they're useful. Um, I will give some thanks to the people who have been involved, especially Reno Buerta, um, my PhD student has been heavily involved in many of the calculations which I'm going to show, which I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk about two specific things. Those of you who were at the taste last year may remember I spoke about applications and I mentioned that I was hoping to get a radon project um, to measure radon in the mines and that I needed a Zulu speaking student to go and talk to the people in the mines. Well, that actually happened. I got the project to go and measure radon in the mines and I got a Zulu speaking student, Sofiso Mengonyama. Um, but uh, I'm afraid that of course, as you can imagine, that project didn't go very far because moving around the country and uh, talking to people and so on has been uh, pretty slow. But we have been involved in, in some other things which I will be talking about. Right, so, uh, how accurately can we measure things in nuclear physics in general? Um, I know students always think we measure very accurately, but I've heard some experts say, if you say you're measuring something, even in a scattering experiment or so on, and you, you say you're doing better than 10%, you're probably uh, uh, optimistic if you think about um, not, uh, not, not so much statistical uncertainties, but systematic uncertainties. But, about distances and sizes of detectors and all sorts of stuff like that. Anyhow, so what I'm going to talk about is actually very low level measurements of radon and why those can be useful to places where they are actually uh, very uh, useful. Just a reminder for some students, what is radon? Uh, those of you who haven't heard me talk about radon before, radon is uh, in the uranium decay chain, one of the radioactive materials, so there it is, it alpha decays. Um, why it's a big issue is because it is a noble gas. So uh, radon in the soil, for, ex for example, can diffuse and, and, and by advection get into your house. And uh, people then discovered about um, 50, 60 years ago that people who worked in uranium mines, uh, many uh, got um, a lot of lung cancer. And uh, in the 1980s, they then discovered that in various places in uh, the US, especially and in Scandinavia, places where houses are very tight, um, uh, have very tight uh, uh, glass and, 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 and uh, surfaces to try and stop uh, uh, heat from leaving the building in the winter and uh, um, similarly air conditioners running in summer. So places like that, you find that the ventilation in the houses are not so good and radon can build up. And it's now generally accepted that uh, uh, radon is the second most important cause of lung cancer after smoking. Anyhow, so all of this uranium decay chain, and there's quite a lot of uranium everywhere in the soil outside, you know, not large quantities, but so that one can easily measure it. So that's um, uh, one of the things which nuclear physicists are good at doing. Um, so one can uh, measure or anything in this decay chain if you can measure it in some way and you will find out something about um, the chain because of course in general it will be in secular equilibrium apart from a few things like radon. Radon can diffuse out of the ground and has a half-life of uh, 3.82 days as you can see there. Now this is uh, therefore a problem but uh, why I like radon is because it can also be a tracer. You can actually use it to um, study various systems. Uh, one common one is uh, uh, geohydrologists look at uh, radon in boreholes and they can tell then how long ago it last rained because uh, the rainwater will have a different amount of radon compared to the water that has been underground uh, or in the aquifer for a long time. Um, and uh, in this talk, I will mention a couple of other um, examples of how radon can be used as a tracer. Okay, 
So, what sort of concentrations can one measure in life? Well, if you talk to a chemist, they usually work in parts per million. That's a sort of typical thing that a chemist is interested in. Or if they're really good and they use ICPMS, then they would say, well, we can actually measure at levels of uh, uh, parts, per, uh, parts per million or parts per billion. There you've got nano, uh, nanograms per liter, things like that. That's the sort of stuff which a chemist will tell you they can do. Uh, what about in physics? Well, let's think of one example. In this room here where I'm sitting and probably where you are as well, the typical radon concentration is somewhere between 20 and 60 becquerels per cubic meter. Uh, again, for the students, that means there are 40 decays, if it's 40, uh, 40 decays per cubic meter per second. That sounds pretty amazing. In a cubic meter in front of me here, uh, there will be 40 decays of radon every second. Uh, that's a lot of decays. Uh, luckily, we can't see it happen. Otherwise, we will see, see stars in front of our eyes all the time. Okay, what's that concentration? Well, if you think about it, uh, well, if you use uh, lambda, the decay constant, it's constant for radon, and you, or, or its half-life, then you find that this means that in the cubic meter in front of me here, there's about one million uh, atoms, sorry about that. There's about one million atoms in a cubic meter of radon. Now that sounds enormous. Uh, a million radioactive atoms. Don't tell any of the people who are afraid of radioactivity because they might not sleep tonight if they think about all these um, radioactive elements in the air all around us. So what's the concentration of that? Well, you don't need to be a, 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 an expert to know much about air to know that, well, there's probably about 10 to the 24 or 10 to, 20, 10 to the 25 would probably be more accurate molecules of air in this cubic meter. In other words, 1 million is actually very, very, very small if you think of the total amount of atoms in this cubic meter. So that's about one in 10 to the power 18. It's not parts per million or parts per billion. I don't know what you call parts per one in 10 to the 18. Okay, um, I'm sure some of you know all of this stuff, but um, I just thought we'd mention that to some of the students again. What is amazing to me is when uh, physicists are um, uh, confronted by a problem as they were in the 1980s when people then started worrying about radon in houses, is that they managed to come up with uh, um, uh, unique ways or new ways of doing things. I mean, in this case, what they needed to do was measure radon in houses in places like uh, um, uh, Pennsylvania in the US, where there's quite a lot of um, uh, radium in the ground. Radium, of course, is the uh, parent of radon. So that's actually the best indicator of whether you're likely to have high radon in your house. And of course, if the ventilation is, is uh, if your house is very tightly controlled. Okay, uh, anyway, so uh, if you think of what do nuclear instruments cost, the, probably the cheapest um, sodium iodide detector I can go uh, and buy from a, an agent is about $1,000 or some sort of value like that. But uh, that would not be much use if that was the cost for measuring in houses. And people, uh, physicists came up with different techniques. There's the electric me method, which costs um, uh, about, I don't know, $50 or something like that. No, even less. And uh, people also came up with uh, um, uh, track itch detectors, which cost even less. But that's the sort of cost you can do. A, you can do a radon measurement in a house and get a reasonable value if the um, the concentration is about this level for uh, something like $50, which is pretty amazing if you think of how expensive uh, nuclear equipment uh, in general costs. Okay, um, of course, if the value is 40, then it's not actually a problem. The ones that you're uh, interested in especially is if the values are much higher than that. For those who don't work in this field, in the US, there is a law which says that um, your value must be uh, below about 150 becquerels per cubic meter. Well, it's actually 148 because in America they use picocuries per liter because Americans, well, let me not say something about the units which they sometimes use. Okay, so would one want to measure more accurately? Well, clearly this was a big uh, push for radon measurements to, to see whether um, there was danger to people in houses. So health physicists went around um, measuring this. And you would have thought that, well, there was not much reason to uh, measure more accurately. But I'm going to talk about two methods in this talk. 
where we need to measure things more accurately or where we can uh, learn something by measuring things more ac accurately. The first one is atmospheric measurements, and that's going to be the major part, part of my talk. And the next one is going to be where uh, radon causes unnecessary backgrounds in underground experiments, uh, places where you measure neutrinos, for example, or especially neutrinoless double beta decay experiments, which um, is the one I'm going to be uh, uh, concentrating on. Um, as Steve Yates mentioned, these uh, really expensive underground experiments to try and see whether we can perhaps uh, learn something about particle physics, uh, about what the, uh, how the neutrino um, uh, operates by looking at these double beta decay experiments. Okay, but so first let me go to the atmosphere. So, uh, well, let, let me first talk about other detectors. The typical radon detector, which one would go and buy right now, would be something like the RAD7, uh, which um, Stellenbosch has a few, and I have, a, I have one, and there are quite a few around the country. That measures radon by looking at an alpha spectrum. Uh, this is a typical alpha spectrum from a RAD7 detector, and those are measured from the decays of the daughters of... Uh, of um, radon. It's quite tricky, actually, because if I asked any of the uh, experimentalists, how do you measure alphas? Well, they say we have all sorts of detectors. But uh, point A is that uh, you have to put these things in vacuum, as JJ said, because, of course, um, alphas don't travel very far in air. The typical uh, alpha in at the typical alpha energies, which you get from radon and its daughter decays, um, I travel about four or five centimeters in air. So that's kind of uh, difficult because um, if it doesn't decay very close to the detector, you have a problem. And of course, we want to, in the case of radon in air, we want to um, measure large quantities of air. On the other end, if you pump all the air out, you're not going to measure much of the radon in there in any case. You know, you, you've, you've taken away the, um, the thing you actually want to measure. Uh, what uh, idea which people have come up with is to actually uh, not measure radon but measure the radon the decay of the radon daughter so when the radon decays uh, radon 222 it goes to polonium 218 and the rad 7 works on the principle where it then attracts the these daughters the radon uh, uh, the, the polonium 218 it attracts it to a uh, silicon, the t uh, silicon alpha detector. Um, it sticks to the detector and then it on, in turn alpha decays and you can get a very good alpha spectrum then something which looks like this. This is uh, this um, window A as they call it in the red seven is from the polonium decay and the, the one, uh, the further one is from the decay of that one which is um, uh, lead 214 if I remember correctly. Okay, so one can actually measure radon. You can also measure radon 220, the other radon um, isotope, which has an even shorter half-life um, called thoron, usually. Okay, the good thing why this works well is because uh, if, you get a, if you get one decay, that's probably from uh, radon or thoron, because the other gases in the atmosphere don't give off alpha, so you're in good shape there. Uh, right, uh, the problem... And that's one of the advantages in nuclear physics is sometimes, you know, you don't get lots of alphas decaying apart from the ones in light radon that you're actually looking at. But of course, your statistics could be very low because, as I said, uh, uh, you need a large amount of air to get a reasonable amount of decays. In the case of the RAD7, it has a, a, a chamber inside which is only about one liter. And so if you're getting 40 decays in a cubic meter, uh, you're not getting very many decays in a liter. Right, so you either have to pump a lot of air or you have to have some way of concentrating what you're uh, looking for. So it's, uh, there's lots of clever ways which people have come up with to measure radon, but it is also uh, fundamentally a problem because the concentrations are not that great. Okay, I first became aware of more accurate uh, uh, radon measurements when uh, I got Rainer Butter as a student and uh, his PhD has now been on uh, radon measurements in the atmosphere. So in the atmosphere, because um, it hasn't built up like in a house, we get much lower um, uh, radon concentrations. So can we measure that? Well, uh, the, the me as I said, in a room you typically get 40, in the atmosphere you get usually below 10, it could be two, three, four, that sort of uh, value, becquerels per cubic meter. 
So can we you measure? Can we measure it? Well, there's a group in Australia at Ansto in uh, uh, in in Australia at uh, in Canberra that looked at this and tried to get better measurements in the 1990s already. And lo and behold, they managed to get a uh, much lower value by pumping a lot of air past a scintillator. Uh, let me show you what they do. Is so they have a scintillation screen, and I'll show you a picture in a minute where you can see. The, the sort of sizes, and they pump a lot of air moving past here. The radon will decay. The daughters will stick to the will will will. will um, it will cause a lot of ionization, especially the daughter decay as well, which you try and manage to get happen. Uh, you might try and get these decays to happen close to the scintillation screen. And because this whole system is pretty pretty big, you can actually get a fair amount of counts. Uh, they call this a dual flow loop to filter. DFLTF detector developed by Ansto. And as I say, it's uh, more than 20 years old. Uh, they keep developing them and improving them. Uh, let me just show you a picture. This is, uh, there's a hand to sort of give you a scale and there's the white scintilla scintillating material and you pump the air past it and you will be able to measure the radon. And uh, they measure, uh, so this, uh, this, these measurements are done now on a continuous basis and have been for more than 20 years. This has become part of the global atmospheric watch system where people measure all sorts of um, things in the atmosphere around uh, uh, to, to, to try and just study the atmosphere. And this of course has become big, uh, big industry due to climate change. Um, one of the places, well, I'll show you in a minute where it's measured in South Africa. Okay, so what can they, what, what, what sort of measures, measurements, what sort of rates do they get? Well, they can measure at the millibecquerel per cubic meter level. Remember, in a room where you typically have 40, uh, they will measure something uh, more than a thousand times less than that with this system. Uh, the latest version, that's not the one where the data I'm going to show you is not from that one, is around, uh, uh, they can measure around 10 plus or minus uh, three millibecquerels per cubic meter. They, of course, have to do a lot of things to look at background and they have to calibrate their system regularly and so on. Uh, there's a reference to this um, uh, type of detector. Um, they've published bits about it in various um, articles, but um, actually there's not one article that I found that uh, discusses the whole system and explains how it, uh, uh, how it, how, uh, the, the detail of how it works and more detail on what they, uh, what measurements they get. Okay, so where are these measurements? That, yeah, so let me just show you a typical, the, the, the measurements that have been taken in various places. Note that this is millibecquerels per cubic meter. So when you see 4,000 there, that's actually four becquerels per cubic meter. These blue lines, um, this, this is a big data problem, it's become a big data problem now. The blue lines indicate the change in the radon concentration in the air for the last uh, more than 20 years. The blue ones are measurement done at Cape Grimm on Tasmania in Australia. The red ones are measurements taken in, uh, at Cape Point in South Africa. And the green ones is up on a mountain in uh, Hawaii. And there you get the lowest values. But as you can see, you know, this 2000 would be two, uh, 2000 millibecquerel would be two becquerel. And there are often measurements as in Hawaii, which are less than that. Okay, so what can we learn from that? Well, I'm not a, a, a climate expert, but I will show you something about where it's done. Just for, to, to explain where the local ones are done, this is a, a map of the Cape Town area. This is about uh, uh, two, 300 kilometers. Uh, there is uh, Cape Point. Um, this is a picture of Cape Point where people go and watch the oceans. Uh, this is False Bay over there, and that's where the detector is. Um, I noticed, this is from uh, Reno's thesis, I noticed he's missed out a few important things here. Cape Town is up there, just for those who are not from here. Uh, JJ showed a much better map, but let me just mention a couple of things there. Just off the Cape Town coast is Robben Island, where um, Nelson Mandela was um, incarcerated for many years. There is the University of the Western Cape, where I'm sitting in my office. Um, and uh, right next to my office is the office of Nico Orte. Thanks, Nico, again for organizing this conference. It's working out uh, pretty well. 
so that's where we are. Um, as I say, JJ's picture showed it as well. And then JJ uh, explained where Stellenbosch was. That's important, not because there's a university there, but it's, it's the um, center of the wine area in uh, South Africa. This is the actual detector. It's way up on a mast so that you're not so sensitive to the radon coming from the ground around it, but so that you're measuring the radon in the atmosphere, which, which comes towards that um, uh, inlet from all over. So uh, to be honest, I never figured out why people originally thought this was worth measuring. Um, what you find, of course, is that when the air comes from the ocean, you have very, very low radon levels. When it comes from the ground, from the um, uh, ground areas, then you get much higher radon. So you can tell something about the wind direction, but of course you can do that in a much simpler way. However, as I would show you, you can actually learn something about large areas about where the radon originates from to get there. Right, why are these measurements useful? Um, you can do a time series analysis and see which parts of the year the wind came from which direction. And then especially for the sort of climate change ideas, you can see, has that been changing down the years? So you can do a time series analysis, which tells you about the wind direction as well, where it comes from. Uh, there are a couple of references. Uh, uh, there's a reference way down here. This has already been published by Reino Boerta, where um, uh, he looked at, uh, he and the collaborators looked at the time series analysis to try and see the winter and summer differences, also the day night differences. And uh, we could learn a lot about what wind direct, uh, we could um, correlate this with wind directions and see where it's coming from. Uh, what I think is the most important one is this third bullet point there. What it tells us is not something about the atmosphere just around this area, because uh, radon has a 3.8 day half-life, so it can travel quite far in three days. I mean, if you think of uh, the wind speed of 10 kilometers an hour, in three and a half days, it travels a huge distance. So you actually learn something not just about from uh, the local area, but from where it's come from. So uh, what Reno has done in his thesis then, and what again the Australians looked at in some detail is to do backtracking. And if you've got a measurement, you then work back by looking at the atmospheric conditions to see where this radon came from. And in that way, you can see that in certain areas like in the Karoo in South Africa, there's quite a lot of radium in the ground and therefore it's quite a big source term of radon. Um, as you know, uh, people who do weather forecasting are not very good at predicting what's going to happen in the future, but they actually do quite a lot of uh, um, recording of what happened in the past. So they have great data on where the wind was blowing from and what the pressure was, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can actually work backwards. And there are these computer programs like iSplit is um, uh, an atmospheric transport, uh, transport um, dispersion modeling uh, code which uh, Rainier has now used and sort of worked back to see where the radon came from. So you have a measurement every hour and you have uh, uh, radon coming from all sorts of different directions and you have to backtrack and try and figure out where this came from. So as I said, this is certainly a big data problem as you will see on some of my um, slides coming up as well. Uh, that's just an explanation. I'm sure you could figure out you, you, you have a grid and you see where wind is blowing from and you can see well at a certain time, this is the path which it followed. So the wind picked up radon right throughout that path. Um, there's another one and another one and so on. When you do that and you sum them all together, this is really difficult for Raynaud to, uh, Rayno to show in his thesis. Then you get a picture like this where you can see all the different tracks going to the Cape Town Observatory, and there's the one in Tasmania, the Cape Grimm Observatory. So you can actually see that it comes from quite large distances uh, for, from quite far away. In Cape Grimm on Tasmania, you are very sensitive to what happens in Australia, and you even get some uh, back to traje traje trajectories that go back into um, Argentina. You can look at what happened in the last 10 hours, 20 hours, and so on. And uh, this was quite a lot of computing time and uh, lots uh, lots of uh, data to look at. So this is all in Reynolds' thesis now. He's got lots of data where you can see where the radon that was measured at Cape Point came from, what the different values are, analyze this in lots of different ways to try and see uh, what the distributions are, how it changes from year to year, and uh, things like that. Uh, now, in case you think this is just some funny uh, Australian guys who got um, uh, 
caught up in this idea of measuring radon accurately. This has now led to, to a big European project led, led by uh, PGB in Germany, where they want to look at radon metrology, measuring radon accurately, and also looking at radon flux maps. And they reckon this is worth doing because it's an important contribution to climate change studies. Uh, there's just their home page where you can see several countries in Europe are now quite involved in this um, uh, European project. See, the United Kingdom is part of it. I don't, I assume they will be part of it despite uh, Brexit. Okay, so um, I see time's flying by. Are these the most accurate radon measurements on Earth? Well, if you'd asked me uh, probably last year or a couple of years ago, I might well have said, well, as far as I know, this is the best what people are doing. Uh, but um, I, maybe I, I've now discovered that I was wrong. I started chatting to Smarajit Trembak, uh, my colleague here, uh, and uh, we started talking to the Nexo people. Uh, Nexo is a uh, suggested experiment in the US, which is a follow-up of the EXO experiment, which looked for neutrinoless double beta decay in Xenon-136. Now, I've been working on radon for a long time, but I didn't realize that um, some of the world experts on measuring radon accurately are people working on these underground experiments. Because of course, if you have this sort of system, this is what they're planning to put in um, uh, probably at the snow lab in uh, Canada. So you have a detector, there's the person for size, this is 13 meters, you have your liquid xenon in this case there, liquid the xenon 136, uh, um, or at least enriched in uh, Xenon 136. And you are going to be looking for neutrinoless double beta decays. And you know that the count rate is going to be pretty close to zero. You're going to get a few counts a year. And your detection system is obviously going to be detecting all sorts of things happening in the Xenon. And it turns out that radon is one of the big uh, problems for them. Now, of course, the whole system is put underground so that you don't have cosmic rays coming from the top and giving you lots of uh, issues. Uh, you also have around the, um, uh, around the xenon, you have other material which um, uh, will, will uh, stop the gammas coming from the walls of the material, uh, of the, of the uh, hall. Uh, so you get rid of cosmic rays, you get rid of the gammas coming from the hall. The problem is that inside your inside your whole system, you have a stainless steel chamber, for example, and you have copper pipes and so on. And it turns out that all of these materials have, through the manufacturing process, small, small, small amounts of uh, radium in it often. And you will also find that radon will be released by some of these things. So uh, one of the backgrounds these people have to worry about is um, uh, radon coming from all, everything that they use. And this, as I say, is, is a huge, big story. Um, I found this, uh, there, there are all sorts of data, which, is, which isn't the literature. I just hadn't been aware of it. People like the Borexino, which is the Italian uh, group, also looking at, uh, at these kind of underground measurements. They had uh, some of the best germanium spectrometers in the world. Also, many of these measurements are taken underground. 583 keV is one of the lines in the um, thorium decay. And they are looking for backgrounds which are of the order of less than one count per day. One count per day, not one count per second or one count per hour or whatever. Those are the sort of limits which people are pushing in this kind of um, thing. Uh, there's what I've called the Laurentian detector. I'm not sure, it's now at Laurentian University in Canada. I'm not sure who actually was involved in developing it. It's been uh, running or the system has been running for quite a while and was used um, to, to measure uh, uh, things for the exo collaboration and in uh, the snow measurements. So what they've got is an amazing system where they pump air through, um, uh, through th th uh, the, uh, yeah, gas flowing through a material where you can actually look at radon escape from uh, things like stainless steel and copper. You can also look at um, um, the, the uh, actually measuring radium by absorbing radium and things. What you do is you pump the air past uh, through this chamber where you can collect the values. You then send it on to this active volume where you're going to actually do the measurements. It's a 10 liter chamber. 
So you have a, quite a big uh, volume of air with a pin photodiode to measure the uh, alphas run at a lower than atmospheric pressure, but uh, about a quarter of atmospheric pressure to actually uh, have something which you can uh, uh, measure. And uh, this measure, you're talking about uh, radium, radium in this case, uh, a few atoms of radium per cubic meter or tens of thousands, you know, I was talking about a million uh, uh, before. And so, uh, yeah, and this is mainly used for uh, radium or from uh, looking at the radon release from things like stainless steel and copper. It turns out that copper is one of the biggest problems that nobody makes copper which doesn't have some radium in it. And the values which they, or the count rates which they're talking about are again like 100 radon 220 um, thoron um, atoms per day or 800 radon 222 atoms per day. Uh, again, there have been several publications. Here's one by Anderson et al, which um, discusses this. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in the Nexo design document as well on this. And here we, we spoke about parts per billion. Here they typically talk, uh, especially the germanium guys, at parts per trillion. Right, so this is amazing what people can measure at uh, these sort of levels. They unfortunately say that in this um, uh, liquid xenon experiment, there will always be of the order of 200 radon atoms inside the material. They cannot get totally rid of it. Okay, that's more or less my story, uh, just conclusions and plans. So, so what I'm telling you is that radon is a very useful tracer and it certainly pushes the limits of nuclear measurement techniques. Uh, but there are great possibilities. Uh, Reynaud's results will, will be um, uh, published and further investigated. Uh, this has been a physics thesis, of course, we haven't really looked at all the effects on climate change. But if you look at the um, Australians involved in this, they've got several publications on how this affects the, uh, what, what this can tell us about how uh, long-term climate changes take place. And then we've started measurements now. I've been measuring radon escape from various materials. Uh, that's not at the level which we can uh, play a big role in the next collaboration, but we now have plans for where we're going to measure two or three things which is useful for input into the NEXO collaboration. Okay, thanks to everybody who's contributed. Reino, as I say, all these atmospheric studies were done 99% by him and 1% by me. Uh, Smaraji Triambak's got me involved in this NEXO collaboration and we're hoping that that's gonna be quite useful. And then I have some students as well. Prudence is actually gonna be mainly involved in the um, mine dump, uh, in the mine uh, uh, measurements of radio. And uh, Hoitse Ramonia, she's going to be working on this uh, uh, low level radon measurements and Safisa also on the uh, um, mine, mine uh, uh, the radon in the mine problems. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Thanks for a very clear uh, presentation. I'll allow uh, time for one question. And then there's a little surprise uh, waiting for you, Robbie. So please don't leave. Um, all right, so perhaps just fire away. Um, there was one question from Mose Guy. Uh, yes, uh, allow me to ask you a question about uh, the issue of cancer and radon. Uh, what is the situation with uh, the theory that Bernie Cohen came long time ago uh, I recall it was very controversial, but where do we stand? In fact, his co uh, conclusion was uh, a little bit of radon is good for you. Uh, he came with an anti-correlation of uh, cancer and the amount uh, of radon. Uh, you mentioned Pennsylvania. Um, in fact, uh, <laughs> he came up with a theory why a little bit of radon is good for you. He called it the fireman uh, theory uh, that fireman needs all the time, a little bit of fire to practice. So when the big fire comes, they're ready. Where do we stand on Bernie Coins? Uh, uh, I don't know, some people call it controversial. It looked to me like pretty good evidence. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I try to avoid these issues because they, they tend to become very controversial. You just upset people. Um, 
let me let me let me say how I see things. Um, it's definitely definitely been proven that um, people who worked in the uranium mines in Colorado and in uh, what is now the Czech Republic, the the amount of the the number of them who got lung cancer was way way above what you would expect, even if you take into account smoking, etc. So there's no doubt that uh, level of gonna... radon, if I'm uh, at the level of a uh, a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand becquerels per cubic meter causes I, lung cancer. Me, I understand the issue is how do we extrapolate from way up here to yep, very yep. low? And his yes. idea was that, that there, maybe there is a threshold. Yes, and yes. Maybe yes. it's not a linear extra, in, extrapolation. Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. No, no, I mean, as you know, that's a big. Uh, issue. Can you extrapolate down to low levels? Well, there have been these studies on houses in Europe. Uh, Darby, et al. Darby is a statistician in uh, the UK, and she claims that uh, what her, that data shows is that when you get to low levels, uh, radon is still uh, a cause of lung cancer. But when I say low, I'm talking about 100 becquerels per cubic meter or 50. What happens if you have even lower levels? Well, that's linked to this uh, whole long argument about linear no threshold theories. Um, as I say, I have not studied that. I would be, uh, I, I'm kind of uh, sympathetic to the idea that a bit of radon, you know, what a bit, a bit of radiation is clearly how uh, people evolved. And it, if it was very dangerous to you, we wouldn't be here. Um, there are several places in the world where people go into uh, high radon uh, areas in caves and so on and believe it is good for you. And I know in the medical field, there are things like, uh, you know, when I hurt my leg while running, I go to the physiotherapist and she sticks some needles into it and she says it's good for the muscle to, to tell the body to send some blood there to make it better. And people have similar sort of arguments that a bit of alpha, uh, a few alpha particles could could do uh, the body some good because it, it, it sort of uh, gets the body's defense mechanism to work better and so on. Um, I am afraid I find it very hard to, I think it would be very hard to prove those theories. But Bernie is alive and well. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, thanks gentlemen. Um, can we just thank all the speakers of the 